All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash.media's SourceForge podcast. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm your host, Bo Hamilton, senior editor and multimedia producer here at Slashdot and SourceForge, the world's most visited software comparison site where B2B software buyers compare and find business software solutions. Joining us today is Alex Elias, the founder and CEO of Clue, a really fascinating cultural AI company that is, is decoding and, and predicting consumer taste across the globe. Alex, welcome and thanks for joining us here with our, with our first podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bone. It's an honor, uh, an honor to be your first guest and a huge fan of SourceForge and everything you guys do. So, awesome. It. Yeah, it's, I'm excited. So, I, I just want to jump right into this. Um, let's let's start fairly high level. Um, I, I see on your website, uh, Clue.com. That's Q L O O.com for those listening. Uh, your company offers a privacy first API that predicts global consumer preferences and catalogs hundreds of millions of cultural entities. That that sounds incredible, um, but could you kind of just tell us what that all means and just give us an overview of of what it is that Clue does? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so at at a very high level, if you think about all the ways in which you know tastes are currently being predicted and cataloged, uh, it's usually part and parcel or a small part of a large consumer service. Uh, you think about Spotify in the world of music. Uh, you think about Netflix and the world of film and TV, they've actually come around and become a customer of ours. Um, but then there's all these other areas like OTA with travel, Expedia, et cetera. Uh, and one of the challenges over the last decade plus that we've been operating and when we started building the company is that a lot of that exists in these silos and developers, if they want to kind of build in an understanding about taste, uh, particularly in this new AI era, uh, it's very hard to come by that sort of data while respecting privacy. And so what, what Clue has built is essentially this massive kind of globe-spanning database of cultural entities with a very kind of deep conceptual understanding of what exists. So think all the music artists globally, every restaurant and hotel around the world. Uh, think a massive kind of catalog and database that we uh, build and normalize. Uh, and then on top of that, we have a lot of AI around generating kind of inferences about taste, given totally anonymized input context. So that's a mouthful, but at a very high level, what, what Clues built is what we believe is the most nuanced understanding of sort of consumer preference and taste uh, across these areas that matter, you know, the traditional media categories, uh, all the way over to travel, consumer brands, uh, and so what part of what makes us unique is just the breadth, the fact that we have built this in a systematic kind of normalized way that can generate predictions across all these different categories. Uh, and the fact that we fundamentally empower developers to kind of build products on top of our, our stack. So uh, super excited to be here. Um, we've been building this a long time. Uh, we just recently had an article that came out that was the first one that sort of name checked our, our age and said how, how a 12 year old AI company, you know, did, did this, this and that. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're thrilled and we're in it for the long haul. Right on. Okay. Yeah. 12 years old. Um, yeah, you guys are the old, old group in the, I feel like there's been a lot of AI startups, right? So you guys are kind of just like the, the old guys right. in the room. <laughs> yeah, it's not not long in human years, but certainly in yeah. in, uh, in software and AI years, it's uh, yeah, it's okay. It's, so it's amazing. So you guys are essentially taking large data sets and, and sort of connecting the dots mm -hmm. to find meaningful connections and solutions. Um, yep, that's really interesting. Now, I understand you have a legal background, uh, having completed your JD at at uh, NYU Law School, and you mentioned you had to focus on. Um, internet privacy. Could you kind of walk us through your background a little bit and how it ultimately led to Clue? Yeah. So uh, in many ways, Clue began even before uh, law school, the, the sort of the Netflix prize competition, a lot of excitement around building recommendation engines in the late aughts. Um, that's something that caught my attention. I'm a huge kind of culture file. I play the saxophone and the piano, and I love mid-century Italian cinema. Uh, we we lived in New York City for 17 years. Obviously, loved uh, indulging in the culinary culture there. Um, so so there was just this kind of intuitive sense that all these different areas uh, were not in fact kind of disparate, but there was deep interrelationships uh, between different cultural domains that was worth exploring and mapping. 
Uh, and much of what was being done was incredibly siloed and niche. You know, you had companies out of MIT Media Lab like Echo Nest that were purely focused on music without any concern for how that might interact with, you know, film and TV and literature. Um, so those efforts were obviously noble, but began thinking about this problem space really around that time. Um, was in law school, sort of found myself uh, studying and going really deep on internet privacy. So this was kind of 2009 and 10, you know, a decade before GDPR even. Um, did some uh, substantial kind of writing around sort of the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights at that time. Uh, worked on empirical studies on the efficacy of click wrap agreements, uh, you know, when, whenever you implicitly consent to software, uh, T's and C's and, you know, no surprise, the efficacy is incredibly low in terms of actually garnering consumer consent. Um, so these were things that were percolating in the background. It's largely what I focused on in law school. And actually, we started Clue towards the end of my, my law school career. So we raised capital while I was finishing my JD, uh, ended up completing it. Um, but really, that was part of, you know, in 2011-12, that became part of the, the background of how we structured our service. And you know, we basically wanted to find a way to be able to convey meaningful information, uh, meaningful inference about taste without sort of having to uh, to basically deal with, you know, privacy issues and deal with identity based data. So there was kind of a fundamentally different paradigm where you could focus on the entities themselves and how films and how the characteristics of films and other cultural categories intersect. And then you could actually create services that that ultimately have an understanding of taste without an understanding of identity, which was, you know, how, how that all kind of came about. Um, so, so yeah, sort of played on, on different strengths. Yeah, I love that you have a background in privacy, because I feel like that's an issue that's so neglected, you know, nowadays, especially right. in the tech industry. Um, totally. Yeah. And I want to circle, we're going to circle back, back around to the privacy. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, so you mentioned you your company was founded in 2012. Um, obviously, a lot has changed in the AI industry since then. I know um, consumers, especially and businesses as well, are certainly much more aware of AI than they were 10 years ago, let alone 12 years ago. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how Clue has changed over the years since when it was founded? Yeah, absolutely. It's been we, we've had some dramatic uh, changes over the years. Uh, never in our core focus, so we've always been focused on this very specific problem space. Uh, our initial hypothesis was that this would be super interesting for consumers. So, our, the the way we initially conceived of the service, it was you know let's move away from the kind of legacy UGC user generated content properties like. At the time, and they still persist. Uh, you know, IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, Goodreads, Yelp, TripAdvisor. You had a lot of these siloed UGC properties, uh, many of which have been rolled up by Amazon. Uh, many people don't realize that, um, but Goodreads, IMDb, now wholly owned by Amazon. Um, but you know, our, our our hypothesis was that it would be interesting to have a, a service that was kind of that could cover all these cultural domains, empowered people to sort of understand the implications of their taste, uh, and didn't rely on an ad centric model. So actually, was uh, ultimately only achieved success if there was a valid recommendation that led to affiliate revenue. Uh, and there was many other companies attacking this premise from various angles. I think we were. Uh, one of the more kind of brash companies in that regard, because we just took on all categories at once and said, like, breadth is fundamental to this premise. Um, so that turned out to not be a great business model. Uh, affiliate revenue is uh, ex incredibly slim. Uh, and, you know, even when you have success in converting, there's no guarantee that that, that click path and so on is, is what leads to it. So we basically ran with that model for a while. We accumulated a lot of useful kind of anonymized, a very interesting first party corpus of data, not only in structuring the entity intelligence themselves. So we sort of developed a rigor around mapping the genome of all the different you know, entities and so be it a fashion brand, a, a music artist, a movie. So we started developing really interesting IP just around the structured entity data, um, but also this kind of cross-sectional preference data that we were mapping. Uh, and it wasn't until 2015, so we ran with that model for years, you know, got into the seven figures of registered users, but never really hockey-sticked as far as a UGC proposition. And then 
around 2015, and I think this is declassified now, but we had a very senior product uh, manager, at, uh, kind of leader at, at Twitter at the time, reach out and say, hey, I'm a huge fan of the Clue app. Um, and she uh, basically was like, we're building something internally that's focused on commerce. And the idea was if I could tweet about, you know, obviously now the parlance is different, but if I could if I could tweet about a book or tweet about a restaurant or a movie, as many people do, anyone consuming that tweet could actually, uh, the entity itself would be recognized. So the, you know, the movie, the, the book, whatever, and people can click on it and you have a full-fledged commerce experience with recommendations that have this whole discovery funnel. So it becomes this kind of cultural discovery engine sort of embedded within Twitter. It's a very bold effort. Um, we were partnering with them. We developed, started building over the course of a year, sort of very high scale, you know, uh, and so it was really the first time we realized there's a big model here and sort of externalizing our service as an API. Um, one of our early shareholders is the, you know, the loud tech voice, Jason Calacanis, uh, who's been with us kind of from the start. Um, and he, he always saw it this way, you know, to his credit, he was like, this is, this has got, there's got to be an API that could just do this um, across, across a bunch of categories and empower developers. So, um, so yeah, so we, we ended up, uh, so then what happened was leadership changed to Twitter. Uh, they ended up shelving the effort in favor of kind of customer support. So like having, you know, if people complaining to United Airlines about a flight and creating SaaS around that. So they pivoted dramatically, uh, which at the time was a pretty devastating blow to us. Uh, but the silver, because it was incredible, we were at the 11th hour of deployment. I mean, we really scaled this proposition to the moon. Uh, but the silver lining was we now had enterprise grade, highly scaled sort of externalized APIs that could that could do awesome things. Like people could build on top of this now. So we basically you know, took, took that premise and then started taking it to market. Um, and the first few years were very challenging because there was a ton of identity data everywhere. So from 2015 to about late 2018, um, we had, uh, we were sort of uh, a, a hammer, whatever that expression is about a hammer in search of a nail or probably, you know, there, there was, there was basically or a nail in search of a hammer. I don't know which way it is, but there's there was basically uh, you know a lot of companies that hypothetically could benefit from our kind of probabilistic AI that could generate inference about taste, um, but they had amazing first party joins, determinist or sorry deterministic joins about people's identities, so they could actually predict where you know. Alex or Bo, you know, what kind of auto loan we applied for, you know, using a, a third party service to actually broker that identity based data fundamentally without us knowing anything about it. Uh, and so everyone was selling data in that era that was actually identity based. And so it was very hard for us to go in and be like, hey, you should rely on sort of this informed probabilistic kind of inference from from our AI when they're actually getting like direct identity joins. And then of course, you know, GDPR happened, consumers got a little smarter about consent, CCPA happened, you know, cookies started being deprecated. This is all over the course of kind of 2018 to today. Uh, and so all of a sudden there's, there's been a decimation of this kind of freewheeling identity data flying all over the place behind the scenes. And companies suddenly realized We've got nothing but our first party data that we have, that we have the real kind of consent frameworks around and rights to, uh, and we have to, we have to figure out a way to, you know, uh, be able to infer interesting things about people without betraying their identity. And so, you know, in this new landscape, Clues found enormous success in terms of just enriching in a totally anonymized way, just being able to enrich the kind of probability guesses around people's taste given some input kernel, like a small amount of sparse anonymized input data. So that's been the full journey. And now uh, there's a whole new landscape ahead, which is super exciting with, with the AI space uh, generally. What, totally. When you first started um, in 2012, were you using the term AI? So that that's what's that that's a very interesting question because we had a lot of internal discussions around how to actually 
um, be, because a lot of our job in that era was education. Like clients weren't, a lot of them weren't developer kind of centric and ready to onboard our kind of software. Um, so we had to talk to business leaders, often CMOs, CFOs. You know, there was even if we were lucky, there was a product manager to talk to, um, and certainly the IT leadership. But um, at the time, we actually decided that AI was kind of a dirty word. It was it was something that didn't get much traction when we would talk to customers, and so we had to kind of break that term open and describe it in terms of the end function. So it'd be like a personalization engine. Or, you know, a decision like a, th there would be other terms that resonated more, but in that era, AI for, for up until maybe only two and a half, three years ago, um, you know, AI was kind of a, a dirty, it wasn't a dirty word. It was just a very fuzzy kind of, you know, it didn't garner respect in the way that I think it, it does now for, for real, for driving real outcomes. And I think people needed a more sort of, um, primitive or fundamental sort of description of, you know, what, what the service did. Um, so we started really pushing on AI, I'd say around 2017, 18, like in conjunction with the regulations, it really started to, you know, we, we alternated between calling it a cultural AI and a taste AI. Those are, you know, the two, the two ways in which we've kind of described it. I think both are apt. Um, and Clue, Clue definitely has a lot of thought leadership and kind of both, you know, mind share at least in both those those monikers. So, what are some of the technologies you leverage in in your API? Do you utilize? Uh, I imagine back in you know, 2012, you you weren't utilizing a lot of the large language models or generative AI services. Do you use those services nowadays? Yeah. So in, in 2012, the paradigms are very different. Deep learning was very much in its infancy. Um, a lot of the paradigms then were around kind of matrix factorization and more linear algebra oriented approaches to kind of generating um, inference about, you know, the connections between entities and, and then graphs sort of started getting more and more complex and uh, modeling. And then we sort of got into the embeddings and transformer eras and deep learning and so on. Um, and we've benefited from all those waves because every sort of AI paradigm has different offers, different opportunities and benefits. And we tend to actually leverage them all. There's never, it, 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 we don't sort of deprecate old methods. We sort of add, add to our, our, uh, different model, our kind of, you know, all the different models we run. Uh, and in terms of the gen AI space and LLMs and so on, we are, avid fans of it. Um, and we have, there, there's implications, Clue has implications for it, both on the input side and the output side. So in terms of our property space, for instance, we have thousands of properties, you know, covering that we've uh, normalized and structured and developed a lot of AI around. Um, so everything from, you know, for any book in print, uh, knowing the setting, the plot, the characters, you know, a movie, we understand the, the music in it, the kind of this you know, the micro genres of music. Uh, and if there's a jazz club, that's a merchant ID, you know, an actual physical location, we uh, conceptually understand that that music genre links to, you know, X, Y, and Z music and so on. So there's a lot that uh, language models have helped with in terms of bolstering that foundational corpus we have. So elaborating on it, like we've been able to discover new micro genres running kind of LLMs against all our all our existing corpus and learnings and um, been able to uh, create directed graphs that show how uh, there might be interesting relationships between entities. Um, but the, the real opportunity for us is that the language era we're in right now where uh, we kind of see language as the greatest interface over data. Uh, so it's kind of like, you know, mobile was presented new opportunities. It was a new interface, essentially over data. Um, but I think LLMs now are essentially the new, the, one of the greatest interfaces um, for interacting with data. And uh, that interface still needs to be imbued with data and an oracle of truth and so on. And so a lot of the exciting commercial traction we're seeing now, both with existing customers and prospective customers, is a lot of them are super excited about generative AI. You know, there's multiple customers now at various stages of production that are heavily investing in the idea of creating generative itinerary planners, for instance, for travel. 
Um, and they've come to rely on Clue to provide kind of an oracle of taste. Like, what is it if we feed in a couple, a couple anonymized sets of contacts? What are the actual entity, the actual places someone should travel to, the restaurants they should go to, where they should shop, et cetera, that we infuse the LLM with and then create a narrative around it? So Clue's tooled up to generate that inference within five milliseconds, and it's highly structured, and then it's perfectly suited to being elaborated by a language model. Um, and one of, the, one of my favorite examples is late in 2022, in the early days of LLMs being deployed in customer-centric settings. So it was GPT-3 at the time, and we were supporting a hackathon um, where people were leveraging uh, Clue in conjunction with GPT-3. And one of the winning concepts had, you could just put a single taste in. Uh, so a single, any one of our half billion plus tastes that we have as named entities. Um, so it could be a music artist. It could be your favorite local brunch spot. Um, so you just put in one entity and then it loops through Clue, instantly generates this whole tapestry of probable tastes in other areas and metadata, and then layers that payload within milliseconds into the LLM, which then takes a little bit longer, but generates a long form essay that insults you, insults your taste in, in great detail. Uh, and it was pretty amazing. It was extraordinary to see. And it was kind of a silly demo that was like people were just, it was hysterical, um, but you know, it, it sort of portended this kind of more profound thing that, oh, if you have really solid structured inference and clean data and, and kind of a knowledge graph that's globe spanning, you can, this, this could be tied into LLMs in such unique, interesting ways. And we're starting to see that it's only really in the past two quarters that we're starting to see that meaningfully commercialized, like companies are finally, you know, and you have, we have Fortune 50s that are at the CEO level, they're kind of like worried about putting LLMs that are unconstrained in front of consumers. And one of the big, one of the big places now, one of our big buying factors now is the fact that Clue can help constrain, uh, imbue LLMs with truthfulness, at least as it pertains to kind of culture and taste uh, and, and guide that. So, so yeah, it's an exciting, it's, it's an exciting new era and we sort of have been benefiting on, on both ends of, of the stack. It kind of reminds me of like, I took a few data science courses in, in school and it's like, we, you know, they taught us with Python, Matplotlib, um, the Pandas library, but it was also at the time where artificial or generative AI was taking off. So it was kind of like, right. they weren't explicitly like teaching me, you know, they're kind of like, they stay weary of it. Right. Um, right. But I was using it, you know, to kind of see what worked, what did not And I was able to become more efficient in certain areas. Um, that's awesome yeah so i imagine yeah, i you... mean co-pilot and all the implications for just you know productivity are, are just enormous um it's yeah it's been it's it's a really exciting era to be building things because a lot of a lot of mund you know a lot of road things that are not particularly interesting in terms of you know knowledge work are being automated and i think that actually liberates a lot of um, it, it allows for certainly on our team, there's more thinking happening ironically, which is, which is great. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's not just like automated automation and job replacement. It's totally, it's shifting the way the business works. And yeah, I think it, at its best, it's, it's liberating, you know, uh, knowledge workers to sort of, uh, think on, to be able to explore in a higher plane and that. You know, it's it's sort of like a it's a highly uh, a highly scaled version of how you know um, G Google at the you know in the past used to have some portion used to enforce some portion of time for sort of free thinking and so on. This is kind of a, a more organic uh, mechanism for for enabling that. So I'm I'm very optimistic about the impact, uh, and I think it's like a fractal where you know it seems like. AGI or generalized LLMs and so on are going to solve every problem. But the reality is that it's just creating new surface areas for problems to be solved. And so, you know, I have a close friend who's, uh, she, she's a radio a radiologist and sort of doing research on the impact on, on AI and sort of mammog mammogram interpretations. And, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of opportunities, even in, you know, you'd think it would replace a physician interpreting it, but it actually kind of augments their, their intuition and, you know, can create a lot of, a lot of new surface area. Well, keeping with that, that trend of where things are going, um, 
and the, the changing landscape. So I understand when your company was first founded, it was predominantly a business to consumer company working directly with consumers. Um, I know you guys acquired a taste dive in 2019, which is cultural recommendation engine, which has a social community, according to my notes of some four and a half million users. Very impressive. Um, can you just talk about more about that transition from a B2C company into more of a B2B solution? Yeah. So the, uh, so, uh, when we, uh, when we started, we had the, the, that hypothesis that, you know, we were aiming this sort of recommendation capability. Uh, we were trying to arm consumers with that superpower of kind of understanding their taste and exploring it and being able to really get meaningful discovery, like have, have something they could depend on to interpret their taste and, connect them with things that would be meaningful to them in a much more efficient way that wasn't adulterated by ads or by sort of this reversion to the mainstream um, that we see in the world. So it was kind of an optimistic hypothesis. Again, wasn't, didn't end up being a great business, um, but you know, the, the, we were already consuming our own APIs. So we were already effectively an API business because we kind of containerized our logic uh, and created endpoints. And so our the front end application, so we had an iOS app at the time, we had a website, et cetera. All that was essentially a client of our own API um, such that when Twitter, the, the reason Twitter was interested in that era was that we were already structured in such a way that we could now just externalize, you know, using some of the API kind of paradigms at the time and OAuth and so on, they could, we could then externalize that. Um, so what happened is over the years, you know, we firmly pivoted to being supporting enterprises and developers. Um, and, you know, we never lost our passion for the consumer problem here. Like that, that's really what, that was kind of the foundational, like motivator of myself personally, of our founding team kind of starting the company was trying to solve that problem for individuals. Um, and of course there's the argument that, you know, by empowering enterprises and other developers are kind of implicitly solving it in more of, of a B to B to C way. Um, but you know, the, the, uh, that, that passion never left. And there was a company founded by former IBM engineers, uh, based in Amsterdam, uh, called taste dive, which, uh, started before us. It actually was founded in 2008. Uh, and we were, we had, I'd become a user over the years. So part of what led to my passion is like, I kind of need it, you know, the clue app was no longer consumer facing. And so I wanted a place to be able to catalog. And so I became enamored with the community in it. Um, the sort of, it was really capturing the long tail of preferences. Like it had a very niche uh, and very global. So 30% only is US based. Um, so you had, um, but it would show you how your taste overlapped with other members in the community. It continues to do that. And I was just shocked that there was, you know, there, there'd be a woman in Turkey who had very specifically, you know, shared my, my taste in music and cinema, you know, and, and there would just be, it was kind of this beautiful sort of optimistic thing. Um, they were running on Google ads at the time. It was basically a, um, so, uh, and they also had an API. So they started building an API that they were externalizing and they had a very different customer profile. They were making it mostly available for free to fairly high rates. Um, and uh, mostly kind of servicing individual developers who were sandboxing. You know, there was all sorts of things, like the biggest movie site in Romania was entirely powered by the Taste Dive API. So it had, and then there was some large enterprises that were kind of tinkering with it. Some of our big customers now started off tinkering with Taste Dive. Um, so we decided to, you know, we had discussions with our founding team and some of their investors and, you know, ultimately decided to acquire them and uh, with with really the intent of continuing and expanding. So we've been steadily expanding Taste Dive. Um, we have some really exciting things coming to it. We expanded the category coverage and now covers places globally in addition to the media categories, expanded it to podcasts, which it weren't covering, it wasn't covering before. Um, and, uh, and, and we removed all advertising. So it's completely ad free, completely free to use. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's super exciting. Uh, it's one of the most symmetrical cross domain panels. So the taste inputs that are being generated are very explicitly in a highly structured way, connecting the worlds of music, film, TV, dining, 
uh, you know, podcasts, literature, et cetera. It's like a, you know, the, the average contribution on that platform, there was a stat we pulled a little while back. It was like 42.7 signals per capita spanning at least 3.8 data domains. So it was kind of like a, it's an unparalleled, it's and it's wholly owned by Clue. Um, it's something that we train, we train on those joins between entities. So nothing to do with consumer identity. You could use Taste Dive totally anonymously. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, purely, we're purely interested in kind of how these nodes, these different cultural entities uh, interrelate. Um, so I think that that's given Clue a big competitive advantage from a modeling standpoint, because we have this very proprietary corpus in addition to all our other sources that helps us continue to refine, particularly the long tail of tastes and the cross domain associations. Yeah. Have you, have you um, used like, I'm curious more about like your, um, your clients, you know, I noticed you, you work with, with PepsiCo, you've worked with Universal Music Group, Netflix, I saw Samsung, a lot of really recognizable global brands. Is there a, an industry or industries that you could, you think could benefit most from Clue? Yeah, I think there's there's quite a few. Um, w one of them, I think financial services uh, is already leveraging it. There's some big firms using it, and I think they have a huge amount to benefit from because they have this really interesting kind of nexus of transactional data. They're heavily regulated. They're very privacy focused. Uh, there's very little they can do with their data. And so Clue can uniquely, given very sparse inputs, Help them enrich at an at a merchant level to like understand go from just understanding where people spend money to what their tastes are across all categories. And when you look at your average large, uh, very large kind of global financial institution that's spending billions in marketing, uh, just the marketing efficiencies and actually understanding at a granular level what tastes look like um, across across their categories are enormous. Let alone driving rewards and spend for travel and things like that. Um, I think travel generally has been a big beneficiary of Clue. Um, you think about a global hotel group that has, you know, they're really relegated now to their first party data. And so all they really know is like where people have traveled in the past and what hotels they might have spent money at and so on. Um, and to be able to enrich that anonymously to this kind of 360 degree view of where people might want to travel and transact and what events in a particular geolocation might be most appealing to you know, send offers out for that hotel, you know, there's just huge bottom line impacts when you do very basic things like tying Clue into a CDP or CRM and helping decision, you know, what offer goes to whom, et cetera. Um, so uh, also uh, the automotive space has been increasingly an area that's that's been interested in, in our offering. So a lot of cars have connectivity now, they have um, you know, a lot at stake uh, in terms of just understanding drivers and passengers. And uh, in this new era, there's kind of more more of that demanded um, and they want a privacy centric solution. Uh, so I think those are those are some areas that are really benefiting. There's a very large consumer service we're doing something with that will be announced soon. Um, that's kind of integrating Clue in a very novel way. Um, to make the consumer experience tremendously better, their core value proposition. So there's it's not much I could say there, but it's it, it will be uh, announced soon. Um, and then we've had exciting, you know, things like the ticketing space, event space. You know, there, there's an ephemerality to that that good. You know, events come and go. They're highly taste focused. Um, so even though they might they might ultimately touch on a compound areas of our knowledge graph, like, you know, a concert might have multiple music artists or, a, you know, a comedy show might have a lineup and, and so on. But these are like fundamentally taste-based goods. Um, and there's very limited taste-based personalization going on in a lot of these platforms. So, you know, any platform that's doing hundreds of millions in GMV, you know, selling a taste-based good um, could, could benefit from taste AI in a, in a very kind of you know, I don't want to call it low hanging fruit, but it is. Um, yeah. So th th those are some of the areas like really when we zoom out, um, I think uh, the, the core value proposition is any company that has something at stake in understanding consumer taste, either to increase marketing efficiency, sell more goods, et cetera. 
Um, and uh, also in recognition of the fact that tastes are getting more and more fragmented and, and faster moving and more difficult to predict. So sort of the traditional methods of kind of focus group or, you know, demographic based analysis, um, you know, uh, the, the basic panels like a Nielsen and so on are, are, are sort of, you know, not, not going to cut it in a, in a very kind of dynamic, fragmented landscape of, of taste. So I think those are those are some key areas where, where people can really, really benefit. Um, and the, the other one is really like companies that are siloed in one area of knowledge and they have something to gain. So like Netflix knows about the content it distributes and they're interested in expanding their knowledge to other areas. Like what music is most relevant to various audiences and various entities they cover, even what film and TV shows out of network. So like, you know, content acquisition decisions, like licensing, what to, what to bring into their network. Um, but, but moreover, even things like fashion taste based on TV, you know, TV viewing habits for their merchandising team to better, to do better endorsement deals and bring on, there's just, there's a lot at stake in kind of understanding consu consumer taste. Um, and I think that's, that's really where, where we end up uh, playing a role. Interesting. Yeah, that's those are some great examples. Because when I first was trying to visualize what you know an, an area, an industry that clearly would be perfect for, I was thinking of maybe a coffee chain. You know, helping them curate um, a music playlist for a cafe, or even help curate maybe featured beverages based on. So, the so we've done we've done that exact. We we the clue literally powers for a major QSR company. What music plays where. Um, and I'd love to take you through, we could, we should, uh, sit, sit down with the API one day. And it's just so fun to punch in random coffee shops in Japan versus, you know, parts of Paris versus, and just see how the music tastes. And even within New York city, comparing the Bronx to the Midtown to Tribeca, uh, and just seeing how music tastes, the inference around it are totally, totally different. And, you know, you're never going to get it a hundred percent right with, with AI, but it's, it's a highly informed guest that just gives them a huge leg up and store experience. Um, so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's, it's yeah. Like when I think of a coffee shop, I'm like, I, I, there's something to be said about a coffee shop. That's like the same everywhere you go, but right. I, I find myself gravitating towards, you know, a, a coffee shop with its own like persona and personality. Right. Also, you know, I'm in Oregon, so the my coffee shop oh, is going to be different, have a different feel than maybe like a shop in Florida or Hawaii, right? right? And Oregon has great coffee. I know we were talking about coffee, coffee earlier, yeah. and I have a, a large right. pour over here that I that I yeah. sort of chug on all day. Um, yeah. Speaking of yeah, which. it's tough to to go anywhere else if you like for coffee. Now, there's there's a lot of great coffee yeah. shops all around, but um, can't What's complain. your favorite one in uh, in Oregon? What's the if you were to name name one, um, my one of my favorite chains um, is a company. It's called Black Rock Coffee. Oh, cool! It's great, quick, yeah. Shout out to Black Rock Coffee. <laughs> nice. Um, but there's no shortage of local coffee shops around. That's now, amazing. I, I want to. I'm curious. What What are some of the the biggest or most impactful problems that you you solve for your clients? I know you touched on some of them, but do you have any? Um, Anything that comes up frequently where it's kind of a, some friction or just issues? Yeah. So, um, so some of the biggest uh, challenges that, that we solve are, are really where there's just where a company is hitting a wall in understanding their, the consumer and they have a big decision to make, something to deploy, or just a lot at stake in terms of. Um, so, we, we had recently uh, an energy company um, that was basically looking at installing uh, electric vehicle chargers at all their gas stations. And they just kind of hit a wall. They had major consultants brought in. Um, they had major research firms, consumer foot, and, and hit a wall in terms of understanding where demand, where consumer taste would be such that you have the Tesla owners, the Rivian owners, et cetera, that would, and, and we did this, this uh, very successful kind of project where we basically ran our geospatial kind of taste AIs and sort of generated predictions for where those types of vehicle owners would likely gravitate to and pass through. Uh, it was a very novel extension of our AI, but it had, you know, a big, big impact in that decisioning. Uh, and those are the things that 
get us really excited. And, you know, there's a lot of examples of that in a, in a very systematic way of um, kind of he- helping to really dis- decision uh, around consumer taste and helping break walls open in a way that's totally ethical, uh, that's totally privacy centric, but gives, you know, gives these organizations kind of a, almost like a superpower to now, you know, understand at a very niche degree, you know, what the podcast taste might be and where they should spend media dollars and what, what, uh, what, what uh, item or travel or anything in their inventory they should present when. Um, so, so yeah, there's been, there's been a lot of, a lot of that kind of, a lot of that kind of impact. Um, and, you know, we work with JC Deco, for instance, which is the largest out of home billboard company in the world. They have over 1.5 million billboards around the world. They have an amazing data apparatus internally. They bring in so many data sources, even, from IBM with weather and all these different sources. And, you know, it was, it was really uh, amazing to see them kind of since uh, a few years now, they've been uh, deploying Clue to basically, you know, so despite all the data that they've collected and gathered and, you know, th- there was just something that was, uh, th- that was kind of unique to the Taste AI where translating specific locations of billboards into granular tastes and everything from, TV shows that forthcoming television programs that people would be most likely to, to, to want to consume in those areas to, you know, the very specific fashion tastes that vary block by block in Manhattan uh, and so on. And, and, you know, so the Taste AI was able, Clue was able to kind of imbue it with kind of that, that understanding that had a big bottom line impact for their, you know, their, their business, uh, particularly because more than 13% of their signage is digital. Um, you know, and so they could do real time bidding and personals, you know, there's, there's really a real time decision as to what is, what is shown. Um, so, so those are, those are some cool examples. Um, we've been kind of extending the AI. There's a really exciting new kind of, uh, capability around generating joint. Uh, so being able to pass in two sets of context and explore the overlap between tastes and there's huge implications in certain industries, as you could probably imagine. Um, so, so yeah, we're, we're excited about, about that as well. Sure. Do you, when you sit down with a, with a client and start discussing your API, do you find that there's one particular feature or concept that's difficult to communicate or do you kind of just let your, uh, API do the talking? Um, bring <laughs> yeah, I think what, like- what, that, that's a great question. I think something that comes up or something that often needs to be clarified is how much I think clients have a misconception that they have to bring an enormous amount of data to the table for this to work. Cause there's a lot of solutions out there where it's like kind of a generalized recommendation as a service type platform where you basically bring all your data to the table and then it helps companies make sense of that. And clue is fundamentally not that what clues actually proposing and what we offer is the ability to bring very little to the table. So if all you know is one little kernel of taste given whatever category you're in or just a basic demographic parameter or some generalized kernel of first party, uh, Clue can then pro- probabilistically enrich that across all categories. So even with a sparse input, you get the rich tapestry of output. Obviously, the more compound the input is, the more data points there are, the more accurate the inference is ultimately. Um, but even with very, very little, you're sort of uh, kind of jumping to a different plane in terms of understanding the consumer. Uh, so, so that's something that often needs to be clarified because, you know, we were talking with a, a, a sort of additional hotel group we're now bringing on that's very, very large and global. And that was a misunderstanding. They felt like, oh, they need, you know, they need to have all the data in the world for this to do anything for them. And the reality is that they, they need very little. And that's why Clue comes in to, to help them kind of enrich and expand their, their, uh, their understanding. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. I, I'm hoping some of your future clients listen to this podcast because you, you do a great job explaining it. Oh, thank now, you. I hope they do too. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, do you... Um, I imagine you do at this point, but do you have any direct competitors? Because I know the market has changed so much. Um, and if you do, like, what's something that you really do well? I know you, you definitely, I feel like you probably answered this, but what what's something you do really well your competitors don't? Or alternatively, uh, are there alternatives you find your, your customers evaluating against Clue? 
Yeah, great question. So we, we've seen competitors within silos. So companies like Echo Nest, which were acquired by Spotify, they had a very similar thoughtful approach uh, and offered a wide range of endpoints pertaining to music based on knowledge, content, you know, uh, co-occurrences between music artists. Um, so certainly anyone looking to specifically consume our service for the purposes of music might find some alternative APIs out there. And similarly in the world of film uh, and some other categories. Um, but what we most find is that the thing a lot of our customers are most interested in is that enrichment across categories. And that's something that's been fairly unique to Clue and Taste Dive, which we acquired and internalized. Um, but there's uh, what we often find, I think, is the most often suggested alternative is sort of a roll your own approach. So we have a lot of companies, just given the scale of the organizations and the amount of technical resources they have, there's just very often this kind of sense of like, maybe we should try building this ourselves and try mapping tastes and entities. And, uh, and we've seen that with some of the biggest, one of the biggest retailers in the world. Um, we entered into a protracted kind of contract with, you know, three years ago. Uh, and they ultimately at the board level decided that this was a capability they needed to own and they were going to build it themselves. And uh, we checked in with engineers. So we ultimately, you know, didn't engage and we checked in with some of the engineering leadership there, um, you know, a few years later and they hadn't yet built it, you know, uh, it, even though they have all a huge balance sheet, you know, huge headcount. It's a very niche problem. It takes time. The procurement of the data is extremely complicated. Uh, it's very difficult to do it with regulatory compliance in mind as well. Um, so, so yeah, we often find that, you know, a company uh, that, that we kind of help a lot of companies uh, avoid the sort of headaches of attempting to build a global understanding programmatically delivered of, of consumer taste. So, um, yeah, it's been, been exciting from that perspective. I know you, you teased some new features or announcements. Do you have anything that you would like to share in the podcast or do you have anything that you'd like to tease um, further um, about Clue? Yeah, <laughs> I <have to> so <laughs> I do think, uh, so, so that, that idea of kind of comparing tastes and bringing multiple tastes into account has huge implications for consumer facing applications. So um, there's even like a large uh, sports ranking for us to think like the handicapping, these types of things, they have a highly scaled app. They're actually using it for sort of a, a matchmaking application. So there's definitely uh, implications there where, you know, we're, we're going from single player mode of here's a set of context and generate inference to multiplayer mode where it's like, here's multiple sets of context and show us the overlap and, um, and then the other major product feature really is that we realized in the many of our conversations that many customers are not yet at a point where they need this at programmatic scale. Programmatic scale is what I would consider to be more than a million requests per month, for instance. And some clients have provisioned 5 billion requests per month, but anything sort of north of a million is no longer ad hoc research. It's like a programmatic use of our system. Um, but there's a lot of companies, so in everything from independent film producers to a restaurateur with three restaurants to who desperately want to kind of have that same understanding of taste and aren't really interested in consuming APIs at a programmatic scale and so on. Um, so we're launching very eminently, uh, and uh, anyone who's interested in this should reach out. We're launching kind of a essentially a fully uh, self-serve research tool that requires no technical knowledge whatsoever, but can fully interact with the expanse of our kind of AI uh, and generate, in, you know, so if you were a restaurateur and you wanted to know what mus the music tastes of your three biggest competitors, you know, within a certain, within certain locations are for whatever reason, or if you wanted to understand, you know, if you're a hotel, hotel owner, um, we have, we have a share, a large a shareholder, uh, who uh, has a large hotel group, probably easy enough to look up. And he's been leveraging, he's been very interested in just ad hoc research about like what shampoo brands to put where, you know, through, through, throughout their hotel. They have very niche hotels with kind of interesting personalities and 
Um, so, or if it's a film producer who's looking at casting decisions or scoring, or if it's a fashion brand that's looking at who to do an endorsement deal with, these are all kind of ad hoc research use cases. And so we basically are rolling out a product that's going to be a much lower cost um, that allows for queries in the range of thousands of requests per month rather than millions and um, allows people to fully interact with the AI and create, you know, queries that are very intuitive and visualize the output in cool ways. Um, so that's coming online very soon. It's pretty late in development, um, but but it, it'll it, it's a super exciting expansion for us as a business because it allows us to take on, you know, a, a, a huge kind of area and pockets of demand that we just haven't been able to address in the past. Um, hmm. So so that's, yeah, that's some of the hope wow. there. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so it, it's sort of it, it's funny because we're going we're going this direction towards making it intuitive, self serve, total layman, and then we also have a few applications more on the hardware side where they really want on device learning, and so we're also working on containerizing our AI as an appliance that a phone maker, uh, in flight entertainment you know, on, on an airplane can have taste AI. So if you're on that flight and it's, you know, needs to, you want film recommendations, you want restaurant recommendations for when you land, et cetera, it's all containerized in a, uh, in an on-device, totally privacy centric kind of uh, solution as well. So we're sort of expanding in both directions out from our core API service. Do you see that? Uh, do you kind of see that that's where it's going is more on-device processing or I'm curious about your thoughts on the um, the industry as a whole, like where you see it's going in the next five to 10 years from now. Yeah, I do think differential privacy is something that's a huge theme at companies that we all know, like Apple and so on. And on-device learning is a huge theme. And, you know, we were initially skeptical of that. We're like, is this something we're building uh, where there's just one customer out there or three, you know, but w- what we're slowly starting to realize, like we had a conversation with a major uh, airplane company lately and that was they're one of many airlines you know and they're interested in it and then we had a conversation with you know uh an automaker they're interested in it and so suddenly we started realizing there is more of a and and there's something that's very compelling about the fact that it doesn't need to take a round trip to an external server um so you sort of inherently you are delivering an appliance that is capable of just living on prem within their environment Um, and I think there's something very compelling about that. You know, there's still the need for entity hydration and updating the model and so on, but it does give them, um, you know, a very feature complete kind of version, uh, that, so I do think that'll be a bigger and bigger trend, particularly given where the regulatory environment's headed and everything else. So yeah, definitely. Um, Well, I'm coming up towards the end of my questions for you, but I want to do something a little fun that we can pull a little snapshot from, um. And I want to circle back to Clues Solutions. So there's a lot of sort of useless marketing jargon out there, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence. I, I feel like every business is guilty of it to some degree. So if you were to give a short audio snippet of your company's solutions right now, what might you say? A short audio snippet. So Clue allows you to generate informed guesses about taste in music, film, travel, all the major categories using very little input data as context. So you can pass one little thing that's known and then Clue will generate an AI informed guess about all the other tastes and preferences. And it's been proven to have a big impact and to be shockingly accurate. Uh, And it doesn't require anyone's identity or anything of that nature. That might Very be privacy centric. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> and then is there one big thing that you would like to tell potential customers? Like if you were standing on a rooftop shouting out to your customers, what, what might you say is the one big thing? The big thing would be that Clue is easy to use. You need barely any data to tap into it. And you probably have a huge amount to gain if you get this highly scaled global understanding of of taste. Uh, It could make you more efficient marketers. It could help you sell more goods. It could help you create better content. Um, So definitely come check it out because it requires very little resources and very little data to get, get the flywheel spinning. 
That's awesome. That's that's great. Well, thank you so much. I'm curious, where, where can people find out more about you and get in touch with you? Yeah, so feel free to reach out to us, info at clue, we, info at clue.com. We check all the inboxes. Uh, if you want to reach out personally, alex at clue.com, pretty simple. Um, would love to hear from you all and uh, super excited for what's ahead. And particularly if you're an individual developer who's building something interesting or within a large company and you have some cool ideas that you want to sandbox around with, uh, we'd love to support you. So definitely, definitely reach out. Wonderful. That's great. All right. Clue.com, Q-L-O-O.com. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Alex. I really appreciate it. I think this has been super insightful. I know personally, and I hope a lot of our listeners got something out of this as well. So hopefully we'll have you back one of these days. I would love to come back and thank you, Bo. I really appreciate the thoughtful questions and look forward to being in touch. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you all for listening to the Slashdot Media SourceForge podcast. I'm your host, Bo HD. Make sure to subscribe and stay up to date with all of the upcoming B2B software related podcasts we have for you. Hope you guys take care and I'll talk to you the next one. Thanks, Alex. Awesome. Thank you, Bo. Really enjoyed it.